Personally, nice to see everyone for the second talk for today. Um, it's really my pleasure to welcome Dr. Holly Smith. Uh, Holly, as many of you know, because you've read a lot of her work, is one of the world's <coughs> experts on linking things about how teeth grow to things about how whole organisms grow and how all of that is packaged together over time to produce the wide variety of life history features that we see across primates and, and I think she'll talk about mammals in general today. Um, it was sort of interesting, I met, I, she didn't know, of course I just had to tell her earlier, that we actually met in the early 90s when I was a grad student at Washington University and Holly came to give a talk uh, and at the time I'd already picked my dissertation which was on boring things about teeth and heard a talk about really exciting things about teeth and thought one day I'm going to try to do those exciting things about teeth and it took me probably about 10 years to come around to all the cool things about teeth and life history that Holly's going to talk about. Um, so it's really a pleasure for me to welcome Holly back to, to ASU. She was a visiting assistant professor here in 1985 uh, for Christy Turner. He received a fellowship to, yeah. which relieved him from teaching, and so Holly came here and did some teaching, and had made a comment in walking around the building that one or two things seem to have changed. <laughs> <laughs> so with that, I'd like to welcome Holly Smith and talk about what teeth can tell us about the evolution of life histories. Welcome. Thanks. Thanks. Well, this might be a funny title for this audience. How many people here have spent some years studying teeth? Oh, okay, yeah, I would, I would think so. All right, so um, I have to start in the way back machine here um, to explain something, something about uh, some issues that are around today and how I got here. So I was a visiting professor here in the 1984-85, I saw today the plantings have changed out front, uh, but otherwise it's still the same beautiful building in many ways. 1985 was a, really, was a really big year in my life. I was here and then um, I had a grant to go see the original hominin fossil material in Africa and first Philip and I uh, went to Egypt and excavated uh, uh, Eocene fossil whales, and that was terrific. And then we went to Sub-Saharan Africa and saw some of the fossil localities and saw the real material. Who were the people in that picture? <laughs> Which one? <laughs> that one, I hope you can figure it out. This is <laughs> Philip. And then this is a paleontologist named Norbert Schmidt-Kittler. You might not know him. Uh, and other people we met at the Devon Hotel over uh, dinner every night. Uh, so 1985, while I, was, while I was in Africa looking at the original specimens, one of the things at the time I was studying tooth wear, one of the things I was really wondering about is how old are these juveniles? How long did it take them to grow up? Because eventually whatever you try to study about tooth wear, you run up against that problem. So while I was studying the fossils, this paper came out in Nature, and it really changed everything. So this is from Bromage and Dean, Nature, 1985. And for the first time, they had a way to try and see real time recorded in teeth, because they looked at the lines in bands that, are, that record circadian rhythms in teeth, and they tried to account for how much time had actually gone by. And it's these three individuals that were so particularly important because they were three juveniles that died just about the time they were erupting their first permanent molars. And of course, these are what we call the six-year molars. And one after another, they could not account for more than about three years of time. There was some estimation involved, but you really, there was no way you could make these numbers turn into six. And to me, I was thunderstruck by this paper. And to me, I jumped to all kinds of conclusions. To me, that meant 
here is this whole stage in hominid evolution where we were nowhere near as human as people had made us out to be, and that early hominids grew up like chimpanzees, okay, on the basis of these three individuals. But that's, that's what it meant to me. Okay. Uh, as I got back to the University of Michigan, there was starting to be a really terrific group of evolutionary biologists. Dick Alexander was there, same guy who pulled Randy Nessie uh, into evolutionary biology out of medicine, and then Richard Wrangham, and then Kim Hill. And I got a, another education uh, in more general principles about growth and development. Um, and again, in 1985, a big paper came out that Richard Wrangham introduced me to by Harvey and Clutton Brock. The first time there's a big compendium about uh, the ages that primates do various things in their lives, like age of weaning, litter size, um, gestation length. And to me, I had spent my life studying hard tissues, and I thought, this is peculiar. There's nothing about a hard tissue in this whole matrix. Nobody has, and, and I'd spent, anyway, that, the whole thing I was familiar with. So I really thought that perhaps I'll understand life history if I write it in teeth, and then maybe there'll be a more general way to say something about what that Bromwich and Dean paper meant. So I, was able to pull up enough uh, ages of primate tooth eruption to sort of roughly go across the order. And I've updated that old paper a little. I have a, um, some more data now. And at least these are all uh, individual genera. So there are no just tight sister species in the same genus in this. Basically, when you use age of eruption of the first permanent tooth as a life history variable, Correlations went up across the board. Everything looked better. It was more highly correlated with reproductive variables than they were with each other. And now here was a nice thing because we have two things here. This is one of the better ones, log adult brain weight. We have two things connected that are in the fossil record. We can tell you something about brain size and the evolution of brain size, and now we have a way to talk about uh, how that might be related to something in growth and development. And I argued that it looked most likely to me that the tooth was really just a general measure of your rate of growth and development, that I thought that that's probably why it was doing well, is that it was just a variable, something with low variability. Now, if you look at this, I mean, it's a, re a really remarkable fit if you stay up here with the anthropoids. But there's something a little bit dodgy here. And it always makes you wonder, what is that? And then here, just to show you, I can update that a little with uh, primates shown against a backdrop of other mammals now. And a lot of times, if you compare different orders of mammals, it's best to um, measure time from conception because they have such different gestation lengths, a very long time in artiodactyls, a very short time in carnivores. So this just counts time from conception. But one of the things I just wanted to show you is, do you see this? Now you can see it more. And I think most people would look at this and say, well, it's because they're related to each other. There's something funny here. Well, this is not because primates have a special relationship with artiodactyls, OK? So there's something funny going on here. But it's not just about who you're related to. OK. So there's been uh, some 20 years of work on this or more. And the only thing that's peculiar about this literature is that it has some odd attraction for uh, women named Smith. <laughs> and if you read something about the, uh, a paper about the Neriacotomy Homo erectus skeleton, you will read, Smith says this, and Smith says this, and Smith says that. And it's, um, it will make your head spin. And so uh, if it weren't for Gary Schwartz and Jay Kelly and Christopher Dean, I think it would be an unreadable literature. 
And now, <laughs> Tim Smith is coming into it, and now they're going to be two T Smiths, so it's going to break all the citation rules. Okay. So I think we had a, 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 a good solid period when people were using teeth as a life history variable. And then this paper came along. And I could say I'm using this as a straw man, but I think it had a bigger impact in the field than that. This is Robeson and Wood. It was a very big paper uh, laying out a lot of firm definitions and organizing as Bernard Wood is wont to do. And uh, something I understand more as I get older. Okay, so he said, no, life history is this. And it's it's really peculiar list for someone who studies the fossil record, because this is what they did. They said, no, these things are life history. You can't know them in the fossil record. These things, here are all the things we can know in the fossil record, and they're secondary, you know. It was a really odd paper for a, a paleontologist to say. They're just related to life history. There's nothing of primacy about them. Okay, so I think so. I think that uh, the best thing to go back to is if we're going to talk about life history, just stop and say for a minute, it's not a list. It's there's actually an underlying principle of what you're interested in, and to keep that in mind, is that it is the working out of an evolved strategy of the allocation of an organism's energy into growth, maintenance, and reproduction. Now, it's always worth just remembering that you can't do everything. You can't raise a thousand high-quality offspring. There have to be trade-offs. That's a good general definition that's good for the cottonwood tree or the nest of bunnies. Okay. Uh, I think sometimes it's good to get away from primates and humans, and it, it, it was extremely refreshing to me in my life to go study whales with my husband. It really, it was just great to get away. So if we want to talk about how to pull life history from the fossil record, this is the best place to go. Take a look at what the people who study Mesozoic mammals have done. And they had a really difficult problem. They're trying to show the evolution of an endotherm that makes its own generates its own metabolic energy from an ectothermic or cold-blooded ancestor and trying to see if they can see when you get determinate growth rather than continuous growth. I'm just put it all in one here to not spend too long on it. There is good fossil evidence <coughs> that back in the Mesozoic, the early mammals have evolved endothermy that they grow to a determinate size, that it seems very likely they lactated, gave birth to very immature offspring, and um, were ecological and dietary specialists a good hundred million years before people thought that. And I put in parentheses um, the evidence that that's based on. And if you can see, except for the top one, the teeth, how they occlude, whether or not they're replaced uh, onto genetic series of skulls is the basis of how all these things have been determined. It's a pretty interesting literature. Um, one of the things that's really fun, if you have the time sometime, you see the thing about endothermy. Um, there's a scientist named Cowles, Raymond Cowles here in 1958. And one of the things he did was he showed that uh, fur does no good for an ectotherm. If you put, if an ectotherm has fur, it just stops them from uh, heat transfer. They just, they can't get warm enough. And he did that experiment by hand cutting little fur coats and putting them on lizards. <laughs> and it, it, you see that paper and you just have to love science and love <laughs> scientists. It's just the most wonderful paper I've ever seen. Okay. Okay. Now, I think to understand how T 
teeth and bones are, are so integrated into mammal life, you have to start with uh, an alligator. Start with something where it's a whole different story. Okay. So these are wild data from the Louisiana swamp. And growth in alligators, uh, they all hatch. I'm sorry, this is really a crocodile, but I think it's okay. Uh, <laughs> when they hatch, they have a complete set of teeth. They'll replace these teeth when they're young, about every month, and they'll replace them their whole life as their skull grows. There is apparently, at hatching, a kind of crushing mortality in crocodilians, and they have evolved maternal care, which is pretty interesting for a uh, uh, reptile. They can, they grow very slowly. They're, these guys are not sexually mature until they're about 20, but they don't even do it by age, they just do it by length. They get big enough and finally they can, the females can reproduce. The males have to be able to control a territory. They can live to be 60, 70, uh, the graph even goes out to 80, maybe in captivity. But their tooth replacement may begin to fail eventually. Peter Dodson, I heard Philip mention Peter Dodson this morning, uh, did a paper in 1975 where he showed that they're never ecologically the same animal because they grow uh, most of their life. They just have to change prey and prey size all their life. Okay. Um, I just wanted to stop briefly in case you've wondered why crocodiles might live till 60 or 70 or 80 when I just said that maybe brain size has something to do with how long you live and clearly crocodiles can't be on the same page we're on. I just wanted to say this as an aside that <clears throat> it's generally agreed that what, that age specific mortality is the selective force that shapes age of maturity and lifespan, but still there are different paths to long life. There's a low energy, low adult strategy for long life. So you can be a box turtle and just uh, protect yourself and have uh, little mortality as an adult or a great big crocodile or alligator. But primates have a different route. So we have a high energy, high juvenile care, large brain, rich resources strategy for long life. So uh, we may live a long time, but it's a really a different way of getting there. So let's take a look at how mammals grow compared to that crocodile. So this is uh, data that were put together to uh, compare to the Darwinia skeleton uh, some years ago. Leanne Nash was my secret confidant who helped me a lot with uh, primate growth and development back then. Okay, so uh, squirrel monkeys, so we have an animal that can live to be about 30, and these are just the first three years of life. They grow rapidly to a finite body length. And if you take a look, the head size has grown very, very quickly. It's mostly complete by the age of weaning. So what mammals can do is they no longer have to put energy into growth. They can, of course, always put on extra body weight if they have extra calories. But uh, they can more perfectly shift to maintenance and reproduction and not growth anymore. And they bridge this rapid growth with milk. And not only, of course, do they have a sort of perfect quality nutrition for the infants, they also have, by necessity, a period of association between mothers and infants where they can learn how to procure the diet and be weaned eventually onto an adult diet at a time when they have a bigger skull, uh, better dentition, maybe a mature, more mature gut. I suppose the last thing I would like to say is um, there are plenty of patterns here to study. Um, very general patterns across mammals. Um, there are patterns between bones and teeth by whether you grow up quickly or grow, grow up slowly. There's lots to study. Okay. Oh, that's what I wanted to say, just last, that 
If you can see weaning, uh, the wild data for weaning puts it right about when the first permanent molar comes in. And that's mainly what I'd like to talk about for the rest is weaning. And why do we care about the age of weaning in evolutionary biology? First, it's a prime determinant of reproductive output. And lactation spaces birth. It's not birth control, which is good for everybody to know. Uh, but it will space it out. And it's certainly a, an energy drain on the mother when lactation is intense. But I think if we spend our lives studying primates, you might not realize this, how much apes are out on the fringe of mammalian life. Because almost nothing else living on Earth today nurses an offspring for more than a year on average. And as far as I can figure, it's down to elephants and rhinos and uh, apes. And even rhinos will only nurse their babies for a year in a good year. I actually got to have a cup of coffee with the director of Kruger National Park because I found so many different answers for uh, how long a rhino will nurse a calf. So when the rhinos are thick on the ground, birth, birth space out. And when they're thin on the ground, they reproduce more rapidly. Oh, oh, except in the sea, sorry. You have to go in the sea to find uh, uh, durations of nursing that are longer than a year. OK. So now there are some really big uh, databases online about mammal lives. Uh, imperfect, we're pretty sure. Uh, but they're uh, a beginning of a, a database that can be vetted over time. So there's this one I was looking at is by uh, Morgan Ernst. It's on non-volant placental mammals. So we've kicked out the marsupials and the bats. And I was interested in the duration of gestation plus weaning. How long does it take to produce an offspring or get to uh, one reproductive event where you get to the, uh, raise that uh, offspring to independence? And it just happens that that's also thought to be a very good measure of a species place on the sort of slow, fast life history continuum. So I just uh, summed that together and it's, uh, took a look at it. And I was quite surprised that it's bimodal. And the cut is here right at six months. So why is that? Why is that cut at six months? OK. So the animals on that side can reproduce two times a year. The animals on that side, one time or less. And at least in this database, which is a big part of non-volant placental mammals, 743, it would appear that there's no really big reason to want to be right in the middle, that you might as well be fast. And once you've gone past a year, <laughs> there's it, it might be just as well to go way past a year. OK, so let's go back to weaning and tooth eruption. Um, it's kind of funny to ask, are they related? Because they're really just two aspects of the same thing. They're two aspects of raising an offspring to independence. They couldn't not be related. All these individuals and their species have to have teeth to graduate to an adult diet. OK, so um, here's sequence of tooth eruption in one easy lesson for the mammals, OK? <coughs> Even though a lot of you know this. Uh, and here we have two wild chimpanzees from the Ivory Coast. So deciduous teeth here are largely, wholly or largely made in utero in general in the placental mammals. And they erupt roughly front to back, and they'll be the first teeth that come in. Everything on the below this line is going to be a permanent molar. And in general, widely across mammals, this is the next tooth to erupt. So the first permanent molar. Then over the years, the second and the third will come in 
front to back. Now these are the teeth that follow along the growth of your face. The eventually, of course, replacing teeth will come in and replace those uh, baby teeth, and that's where all the variance is in mammals, and we can forget about that today. We don't care, okay? So that makes it easy. So, but mammals, in general, we can look at this. When did they finish their deciduous teeth, and when did these molars come in? Oh, so how much chewing area does this baby chimpanzee have? So it, about that much, you can even say it's even less to really chew food. Here we can incise food and hold it or bite it or puncture it or strip it, but chewing, it's this much. When that first permanent molar comes in, that will be doubled, okay? That increases the chewing area by 100%. It's a much sturdier tooth. It will come in sharp and crisp cusps. Uh, so I'm going to just say that it, that's like you've been handed your grown-up knife and fork. Okay. So let's take a look at when uh, primates wean their infants compared to their teeth. So uh, we're going to have several of these graphs. They're all going to be in a log log space because everything about life history is proportional. So here is age of completion of the deciduous dentition, uh, log 10, so that's one year here. And up here we'll put log age of weaning, and I don't care how they're correlated. I don't care where the regression line is. I just want to know how they scatter in relation to the line x equals y, period. Is it before or after? So let's take a look here at this group of monkeys here. They cut their last deciduous tooth at about half year, but they're not going to be weaned until one year, and so weaning is after the eruption of the last deciduous tooth, okay. And you can see here that that's everybody except humans, and we are far off any kind of regression line would be. Certainly we'd have to be up here, okay. Humans, and that's kind of a median through traditional societies, and anytime I see that number estimated, it always comes in pretty near to and a quarter, which is, the age that we complete our deciduous dentition. So why are we so different, of course? And how did we get there? Okay, here's the kitchen sink. Let's might as well go through it quickly. Three, okay, all three graphs, but the, uh, the X and Y are really the same on all three of them, and they're all lined up at this X equals Y, so you can just see whether uh, infants are worn, weaned before or after a tooth. And the results are clear. So primates are weaned <coughs> after their baby teeth are in, at least according to, of course, mean data. Then over here, by the time the second permanent molar has come in, everybody's weaned. That's too late. And this is the closest in here. So uh, the first permanent molar is the closest time, even though it has a kind of peculiar distribution. Okay. So I think we can throw away the first and third of those graphs and just look at, um, just look at M1 a little more carefully. So if you look at what portion of this graph it looks like uh, primates wean their infants around the time M1 emerges. It's just a portion of the graph, and uh, I would say, sorry, that they wean around the time of M1 sort of, you know, as a, a technical term, sort of. Um, and it works pretty well for about a factor of 10 from about uh, 0.3 years to three years, but outside of that it doesn't appear to work at all. Something else is going on. 
So I think that it's better to look at this graph a different way. So look at the same graph and say, but there are limits here, that this is a case of present trends cannot continue. Because down here at the bottom, uh, let's look at the TARS here. Primates are just very good parents. And they're just not going to skip weaning just because your teeth came in early. Tarsiers are super precocious. And in fact, all of our uh, small primates really are super precocious. And the infant is going to have its M1 in like 10 days or two weeks. But that doesn't mean that infant is ready to take up an adult diet. So two months is about the bottom, about the minimum for primates. Now, what happens at the top? Up here, we have chimpanzees and some really, really distressingly late uh, reports of age of weaning in orangs. So up here, if you nurse an infant for more than four or five years, there's just a tremendous cost to your uh, fitness, to your uh, total fertility. And <clears throat> these reports of orangutan babies not fledging even when they're eight or nine, you don't have to have much math to see that that's just extinction. You can't have a 10-year space between births and start reproducing at, what, 13, and then add some mortality on that. That's just extinction. So uh, if you look at that in comparison, too, to other mammals, you'll see that's just insane when you think other mammals don't even go past one year. So this isn't really something special about age of weaning. I think this is sort of failure to thrive or starvation or something. Okay. So I think uh, with tooth eruption, we can start with something general and say, uh, these are learning teeth. That's what they are. And uh, they may start coming in at birth or quickly after birth. But this is not what you really move on to an adult diet with. This is what you learn to eat with while your mother is still supplementing you. And the transition to independent feeding is sometime around this. And that individuals with this many teeth, you should expect to be feeding independently. I think that's a good place for us to start in the fossil record, is to have expectations. And I guess I would say that I would propose this as a the good standard that we should compare mammals against to say, do you wean early or late, is just compare it to uh, the eruption of the first molar. So here is, how long does it take you to raise an offspring to independence? Okay, So here's the standard measure of it, sum of gestation and age of weaning. And let's see, can we match that? Is it useful? to say, well, maybe that's the same thing as gestation and age of M1 eruption. That would be pretty useful. And if you look at that over mammals, and that's, again, just the line x equals y, that seems like a pretty good run through those data to me, except there are some really interesting lapses from that. And I think that uh, w even when they miss, you learn something interesting. Like in these cases, that's the rhino, the human, and the elephant. Each has a very special adaptation that has made it possible to wean offspring before first molars come in. I think in the rhino, it's probably something like two years. But for rhinos, they have a huge battery of baby teeth of all four uh, premolars that most mammals have gotten rid of at least one of those teeth. So they have an immense battery of deciduous teeth that helps them get through. Humans, we're getting through by 
special feeding by special feeding infant foods. And the elephant has totally transformed its dentition. It's a surprise to me that you can even have any similarity with elephants on these graphs, but you can. Uh, there are a lot other things that seem quite clear on this. Carnivores, in general, can wean with less. They have a very high quality diet. Herbivores, a little later, they need more of a dental battery to be weaned. So I think it's a, it's a good general thing to compare weaning against in mammals, and you don't have to always have weight data that uh, this can show you something interesting about an adaptation and give us a way into the fossil record. Okay. Excuse me. So, of course, humans, so we're the only primate to wean our offspring before they can feed themselves. And um, I started talking about weaning matching M1 eruption years ago, and then it kind of got into uh, literature, and everybody who was talking about breastfeeding had to kind of account for this somehow. Could, could the natural age for us really be six? And that would be pretty strange, uh, especially in America where you could get arrested if you nursed a baby past three. Um, I don't think we were ever there. Uh, I think that's just a, t t a huge cost to reproductive fitness. I don't think we were ever there. I think you come up against that limit and, and you have to, f you, the only way away from, uh, from that limit is to some kind of special adaptation to wean babies earlier. Of course, uh, it's always worth remembering that lactation is this perfectly wonderful, flexible, adaptation because any time the conditions are poor, uh, you can just go on. If you have a hungry, fussy infant, you can just wean longer. Uh, you can just nurse longer. <coughs> and human females can. I mean, they're wet nurses known to have nursed continuously for 10 years. If you can get enough nutrition, you can nurse as long as you, apparently for a very long time. But of course, if you continue past four or five years, again, that's a significant cost to your fitness. So, uh, and the human adaptation is the opposite. We wean very early and have close birth spacing. And the only way you can really do that is if you have uh, food offering and if you have special foods. And I think uh, pre-chewed meat would certainly be the best. You can't feed a baby just anything. You can't just pound up any plant and uh, substitute that. The longest age of weaning I know of in humans, I think, is the Ganj in New Guinea. And they feed their babies some kind of sago pap that's just empty calories. And so that doesn't really help you uh, wean the baby. Um, evolution of the human reproductive pattern of this closely spaced births and uh, early weaning ha should have a fossil record. It should have a, a consequence in the fossil record. You should begin to see these things go apart. And now people are doing isotope work or starting to get um, real ages of weaning out of the fossil record. People have People are doing it for um, a lot of other mammals. They've got good data now where things like two years are coming out of studies of medieval cemeteries. And uh, this should be something we should be able to see. So if we start you know, with Australo Australopithecus somewhere here around three, as this gets up here to six and people, as people start stacking their families, Years to weaning should go down. You should begin to see those come apart. And so that is knowable in the fossil record. OK. Um, there's one, uh, um, another signal in weaning and tooth emergence data. And that, I think, is 
um, sidereal time or uh, seasons. And here, for once, I'm going to show you how these things look against body weight. And things look a little different. Okay. Um, here is female body weight in, what have I got? Okay, I've got primates again. And age of eruption of the first permanent molar. And this is about one of the worst possible patterns you could see. I mean, how could it get any worse, that relationship? That's, that's like the last time that you would want to run a regression line through and predict something. They just lie down in flat lines. Okay. And here, um, so I, the first answer I think everybody would say is, it's all, oh, it's because they're related. But if you look in a little more closely, um, it's not exactly that. Take a look at this dot. Now there are data for Megalatopus. Who did the Megalatopus? I've forgotten. Is that you? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Megalatopus tests that whole idea. Okay, because you've got a great big gigantic lemur. So if you look at who is, if this is a timing niche, uh, who's in it? Well, we've got new world monkeys. We've got old world monkeys got uh, an ape, and we've got uh, a giant lemur. So the answer that they're there because they're related seems, I mean, who else could you have? A, a loris or something? We don't have any giant lorises. So that doesn't seem like the best answer. So maybe that's a timing niche. And I think that's one of the really uh, kind of important things fossils can do is they can provide an arena to test hypotheses where you almost have a circle. You just can't get around. It's the answer is because they're related. But there are some really interesting things that went extinct, and they can test hypotheses about the modern world. OK. Uh, I think if you asked anybody about some marker of growth and development, we'd all say, well, it's because you're bigger. Right? You, something's later because you're bigger. Okay, so, but if we look again here at body weight and really get a pretty big sample of mammals, so, and this time I'm counting how long does it take to produce an offspring, the whole thing. How long does it take you? And there's a, a staggering stack up right here of mammals. Okay, from the tars here to the Indri, 29-fold increase in weight and really uh, the time to M1 eruption, which is, as I said, very close to weaning, varies between six months and a year. Okay. Tars here to the elephant seal, time to an offspring with an M1 between six months to a year. And uh, the artiodactyls just look like a uh, real stereotypy here. Eight-fold increase in body mass makes no difference in time to fledge an offspring. Well, they're all seasonal breeders. It doesn't, whether you're adapted to uh, a way of life that lets you be a little bit bigger or a little bit smaller, those guys all have to uh, give birth in the spring. So I think that um, gaps, clustering, and cutoffs in timing of events and early growth and development are probably meaningful. And they relate to selection pressure to fledge a juvenile within either six months or a year. But we live in a seasonal world now, but that wasn't, isn't always the case as you go back over time. Sometimes it's more seasonal, sometimes it's less. So to me, that is telling us that the past might be different from the present, uh, depending on equability or seasonality. And there's certainly plenty to learn in the fossil record. Okay. So I just will conclude with a tooth. I think tooth development is not just related to life history, it's knitted into mammalian life history 
you, you can't do one without the other. And that how and when a mammal, mammal young transition to an adult diet and the form and emergence of the teeth they eat with are a central part of that life history. So uh, this is a definition I used to use, uh, or and I still am fond of, but I think I'll change it to say a mammal, for a mammal, life history is a strategy of when to be born, when to erupt your teeth, when to be weaned, when to stop growing, when to reproduce, and when to die. Oops, I forgot. I always have to remember some mammals laid eggs. Okay. I'll just end with a picture of Raymond. <laughs> Cow's the only one I can find, which is proprietary and owned by Life Magazine. But here's the lizard with the fur coat. <laughs> and there's the plain one. Okay, thank you. Uh -oh. Thank you. Um, I think we have time for a couple of questions, which you call on if anyone has. Uh huh. What's the operational definition of weaning? That. Well, um, I look for ceasing, but uh, the the struggle with what's the definition of weaning is it's like it's like saying this is a first world problem. <coughs> this is a primate person problem. I mean, it is so much shorter for the other mammals. It's really not the issue it is for the people who study primates. But I'm looking for it as. Uh, severation as it's sometimes called, stopping. But I, you know, it's amazing that people can even put a number on it. It's, it's, it would be hard. And another thing is sometimes, like for rhinos, it would, the answer would really be it's one year or it's two years, but maybe the database says 1.8. It's like, can you have 2.5 children? Uh, and what I'd rather have is the median, median age of ending. And it's amazing that the data are, make as much sense as they do when you think how hard it must be as in the field to put a number on that. Right. So because I mean, in primates, nipple contact and transfer of milk are not right. exactly the same. Right. They're showing that that really goes down and down and down. and maybe not very much nutrition is coming at the end and as I said this is a first world problem they're, they're I know they've there's been even more and more angst in in the literature about how to define that and and where it is just as a comment that doesn't seem to be does it help much like isotopic data which shows the same thing you know we have to uh, sort of interpret it and, uh, Yes, it's true because that, and now. and sort of across mammals, milk only is really short period. I mean, there are some data, but they're really rough. But it's it starts to be if you look at histories of at least the ones I can try and find of real primate feeding, it's starting with little bits quite early, and so there's a long there's a long time. And it's true that people who who try and reconstruct it from isotopes have a change and they have to draw it somewhere. And, and they're, you know, they're starting, there are a few data on uh, age of weaning in Neanderthals now, but they're, they're both dodgy. One is Tanya Smith just did one that was 1.7 years, but she said it was all, it was so abrupt, it looked like Way, way early as 1.7 in a Neanderthal, and it looks so abrupt that it would make you think that um, something happened to the mother. And that's going to be the hard thing about pulling weaning data out, is that you can always have odd short times from a mother dying. Uh, and there's always the problem of, did you study dead infants or did you study individuals who lived through? So the second data point for Neanderthals is a Neanderthal baby, the child from Angers, who died at 3.1 while still drinking mother's milk, and that's a collagen datum. So uh, somewhere that's a minimum answer too. So, But I think it will come. And then there are other, there is other fossil 
evidence of family structure a little. There's a, when you get a catastrophic event, there's a cave called El Sidron. Have any of you seen that? So that has a, what appears to be a Neanderthal band that's been cannibalized, and there are mitochondrial mothers for all the children. There are three males and three females, and the females are, no, the males are more related to each other than the females, and there's a perfectly plausible mitochondrial family with a, a teenager, a child, and an infant. Uh -huh. Well, so in, in, in other primates and apes, the M1 eruption is a really good predictor of age of weaning. And also, age at weaning is a really good predictor of the juvenile dependent period. Yeah. And now, all of a sudden, we've got humans where M1 is not a very good predictor of age at weaning. They're still growing up slowly, but... And also, age yeah. at weaning is a really lousy predictor of the period of juvenile dependence. Yeah. Um, and so, as we transition from a primate, from an ape, from a Miocene ape to a human, at some point, it's, you know, it looks like we're moving in a direction where M1 starts being a lousy predictor of at least two life history variables. So what exactly do we feel confident that M1 does still predict by the time we get into the middle of hominid evolution? Well, the... Repeat a bit of that question for the microphone. Oh. So uh, the question is, in humans, as first molar eruption begins to be not <coughs> correlated with weaning anymore. What does that mean? Um, the great thing is that now we can, now people are being able to establish both weaning with isotope work and the age of eruption of the first molar. And when you see those come apart, you know you've got something very special. So if weaning is not around the first permanent molar, look there first. And if it's not there, there's something very interesting going on is the answer. So now you have a place to compare it to. If it drops way below that, there's some special adaptation letting you do that. If it drifts way past that, either the diet is very poor quality or I mean, that will show you that orangs, you know, are so far off into trouble, for instance. They're, these ages of weaning are when they've nearly completed their adult dentition. It's absurd, really. So it's a, it's a comparison that will show you how things have changed. So that's the main answer. And we're so lucky we're actually going to be able to know those. Uh huh. Yeah, yeah, it's a, it's, um, yeah. I mean, it's just the, starting. The the, the only, um, yes. No, you food. know, the, the dietary isotope work on Australopiths, they're uh, so concerned with trying to figure out adult diet, they have not even sorted out what teeth they're getting them from. They, I mean, they're, they're all lumped together teeth that are measuring in utero, infancy, childhood, and independent feeding, because that's what you get across a dentition. And they're all lumped together, and nobody has sorted those out in the people who are studying Australopiths. And then, of course, tooth wear happens at a later time. So I think people maybe don't seem to take note of the, the dietary isotopes for Australopiths, that it's, it's measuring something quite young. But, but nobody's actually looked, in the early hominids, nobody's actually looked specifically for a weaning signal yet. Yeah, they are like no, that. no, they're still just, they're just working out diet. They're yeah, trying to work out good. diet, period. And they're, they're not bothering to even say, sometimes they don't say what tooth they're looking at, and they almost never say where on the tooth they're looking at. So that is really unsorted by maturation right now. Um, and then, of course, all these things are problems of destructive data in the fossil record. That's always the problem. When you do isotopes, you're going to destroy something. Um. I was curious about the 
is. I was going to ask you about the Neanderthal meanings and how it fit in, but you, know, you brought that up and, and I think addressed it. I don't know if it's nicely. here. Um, I was always troubled by that. Oops, wrong way. That datum that I, I thought was even younger than 1.7, 1.2. Whatever it is. I just looked at it and it was, here are the extra slides there was, you know, that I, there wasn't room for, I was just, oops, I guess point, they're not there. We have a pretty good understanding of I'll just leave that. Humans at some point, ability to evolve this strategy of early meaning. And it's always confused me once the Neanderthal data came out that that's exactly the opposite of what you, you'd expect. The Neanderthals were lean even faster than, than humans. Uh, and at some point, there's got to be a bottom limit on when you can mean that, and it relates to issues about gut microbiomes, like when kids have the physiological capacity to deal with an adult diet, whatever. That What's is. the earliest? I mean, the, yeah, there's a portion where it, Neanderthals are top are predators. They close to that. I, I don't know. If the thing is, it's not going to be anything like an adult diet. It's a really special diet that we probably should call a weaning diet. A weaning diet, yeah. right. What is the biochemistry? Do we know anything about the biochemistry of the limits of when? So for humans, you would have to know what the weaning diet is. I can is. remember Stanley Karn saying you could, you could raise real infants on chopped up meat, but he wasn't talking about the, he was thinking about something that wasn't a big bacterial load. But that's also not, yeah. what I have seen hunter-gatherers wean on, which you didn't guess in here, is they don't feed chopped up meat. That comes no. later. The earliest weaning food in every group that I've seen is brain and bone marrow. And both of those Very things rich. are really, yeah. really yeah. energy rich, high in lipids, really soft, no structure at all. And how early could you wean an infant on brain and bone marrow? I have Maybe no idea. Very so early. The, the microbiome's data that I've read summarizes what we know of humans seem to hover in, Randy, you may know more than me, at around two-ish before you have the machinery to really deal with those kinds of, of foods that are incorporated in a weaning diet. So uh, my thought was only that humans evolved, it's clear that evolved a strategy that's kind of pushing at that lower physiological limit. And I was always surprised there are maybe some issues, and it was a brilliant attempt to extract that kind of data from the fossil record. But to push way below that requires some other series of special kinds of adaptations that we don't have a model for yet in primates or maybe in mammals. Uh, how low can you go? How low can you go? Exactly. Uh -huh. You might be able to construct such a model by using age of infant, somehow getting some sort of model from percentage of infant mortality, the age of the infant mortality occurs, and factor into like another parameter of infant <coughs> as, as to some sort of limit as to. So, so the question is, could you, yeah, well, or comment that you, it, it, it would have, have to be tangled with infant mortality, certainly. Uh, all kinds of poor ways of feeding infants that result in their death. Just, uh, just remembering off the top of my head, when there started to be orphanages in, in Britain in a, big, in a big way, they did experiments with what they called dry nursing, where they took milk, you know, and just spoon-fed it into them, and they died en masse. They had orphanage, orphanages where 100% of the children died because of the presumably bacterial contamination of the milk. So uh, it, if you, and, and then you can see pictures of people try feeding, nursing infants off goat teats and things too. I mean, that might be better than, than trying to conserve the milk in a container and feed it to an infant. Uh, so there, there are all kinds of dangerous things you can do. Do you know, Holly, if, if when you get a, a, a woman food stressed to the point that she won't ovulate, yeah. can she still nurse? I don't know the point where nursing would, would cut off, but there are recent papers saying that it's not just this frequency of nursing bouts, that it's the calorie, it's the energy drain on the mother that she has to get. She has to get to a point where she can 
uh, where she has enough surplus energy that various hormone systems turn on again. For the ovulation? Yeah, for the ovulation, but that's the mothers who are still nursing. Yeah. But if you restricted their food, you'd think that eventually they'd stop nursing. But there was a sort of middle yeah. ground there, and you, in big giant quotes, knew you weren't going to be able to conceive. Why not keep nursing that kid for a while? Yeah. Yes, it, it always. And uh, then seasonality lays over that. And yeah, and, and there's always the investment. Shall I invest more in this offspring or in the future one? Or, but uh, these animals who are seasonal breeders. They, ha they have a, an extra, extra variable in their timing. Um, there are some mammals that do wrap nursing and pregnancy, apparently horses, not just domestic horses. Uh, so some of the small maternal primates can in captivity. So, and apparently, apparently you can if you just have super nutrition. I remember when I was reading about some of this, I read about some society of breastfeeding club in Canada, and they believed that you should nurse the whole time you were pregnant, and the, but they just do it with super nutrition, and so you can. And uh, horses apparently give birth and mate in a week, and zebras can do this too. And so there has to be, you know, if you get big enough, you get some economies of scale. And so, but, but you're but saying that little small. primates yeah, can. So sure that's really interesting. Oh, and calotric, it's uh, also it doesn't suppress. Yeah, they're they saying it doesn't suppress lactation as much. Well, but it has to be a question of energy. Yeah. yeah. Okay. All right. Unfortunately, we have to end it here. But thank you very much. Well, thank you.